again to this week's episode of TOSP, the official Cyborgs podcast. I'm one of the hosts, Elf. I'm Amy. And we have our usual collection of odds and ends of stories from around the net, with particular regard to science, uh, from this last week. We also have something a little bit special today. We got together a, a bunch of the Cy bloggers and talk to them about some of the more interesting points that have popped up during the election and during the year. So we'll come back to that later on. But without further ado, shall we jump into some of our news stories for the week, Amy? I think we shall, yeah. Sorry, that was a mouthful of coffee that has an awful lot of grinds in it, so I'm still swallowing some of them. Now, anyway, <laughs> moving on into our first story, um, and, and, and most of today's podcast for our listeners will be uh, taken up by this, this wonderful interview that Elf did with our side bloggers, but we'll also be looking at um, language difficulties and black holes and 17-year-olds in science. So, um, But jumping into the first one is... Um, now, there's a term for, called aphasia, and aphasia is the, is the technical term for an impairment, an impairment of language ability. We see it all the time, for example, with stroke victims, where people battle to, to put sentences together or to remember words. Now, a lot of the, well, in fact, two brain, brain regions have been shown to be uh, sort of particularly important in language processing, and they're called Broca's region and Wernicke's region. And a lot of the science into um, language processing in the human brain and, and, of course, language impairment has focused on these two regions. Uh, but over the last week or so, a new paper in, uh, published in Neuron has, has done something a little differently. It's looked at the connections between these, those, these regions. And it's, it's quite interesting. The regions are connected by two separate pathways, one sort of that's a bit on the top and one that's a bit on the bottom of, of lots and lots and lots of nerve fibers. Um, the the analogy that's been drawn is think of uh, really fat um, cables between servers carrying lots and lots of information. So they thought, well, let's have a look at these. And what they found is particularly interesting. And I'll go into how they found this shortly. But they found that the upper pathway and the lower pathway are good for different things. Uh, so if you've got damage to the lower pathway, uh, you've got damage to, to your lexicon, to your uh, semantics, basically, which means that you forget the names of things, you forget the meaning of words, um, so you forget the sort of particulate stuff, but you're very good at constructing sentences. Your syntax is great, and the opposite is true as well. So if you've got damage to the upper pathway, you can name things, you remember what words are, mean, you, but you can't put them together into a sentence and you can battle to decode a complex sentence, which is really, really interesting. Um, and they found this basically, they, they were able to find patients with very specific aphasias, aphasia again meaning um, a, a language impairment. So they found people who could remember words but couldn't put them into sentences or vice versa. And then they set them little tasks and took them up to um, magnetic resonance imaging as well to watch what was going on in their brains at the time. So, for example, um, uh, researchers would ask patients, a man is walking along the railway tracks. He didn't hear the train coming. What happened to the man? Now, most unimpaired people, so, so people whose, whose uh, pathways are working well, would say the man was hit by the train. But the study found that people with damage to their upper language pathway, but, but not to the slower pathway, said train man hit. And we've seen this sort of thing in chimpanzees as well. So, so the, the words are there and the understanding is there, but not the ability to structure them very well into a sentence, which is fascinating. Um, and then to test the opposite damage, they asked patients, um, and this is, of course, testing uh, sentence comprehension, they, they asked patients, Okay, the girl who is pushing the boy is green. What color is the girl? And they show them two pictures, one showing a green girl pushing a boy and the other showing a girl pushing a green boy. And they found, of course, that those who had um, damage to the lower pathway did fine on this, um, but, but damage to the upper pathway, which, of course, uh, relates to how people structure sentences, they, they couldn't figure it out. They couldn't tell the green girls from the green boys. So really, really, really interesting stuff. Um, at the moment, there's no direct, you know, and with this, we will fix everything. But but it's very, very useful to know how our brains are structuring uh, words and sentences, certainly. Absolutely. it's And it's really interesting that there, there's some really interesting images that go along with these oh, articles yeah. and unusual. Uh, we'll, we'll link to them in the show notes. But it's really interesting to see how these different, uh, these two different regions are actually oriented with respect to each other mm. and how they look like they, uh, they interact over time. Mm. Right, well, um, 
Moving uh, moving swiftly along, along into uh, my article for this week, uh, we picked it up from Scientific American, but it was spurned by an article that was published in Nature this week. It's called Monster Black Holes Being the Most Massive Ever Discovered. Now, black holes uh, come in a range of sizes <laughs> and a range of different orientations. So, for instance, the closest one to us, which we currently think resides at the centre of our um, Milky Way galaxy is about three and a half million times the size of our sun. So, you know, that's that's pretty reasonable. One of the weird things is that when you get a nice wee telescope and you look out into the far reaches of the universe, so millions of light years away, um, you start to realize, you start to discover that black holes get bigger and bigger and bigger, particularly the further back uh, in time you look by looking further and further away in space. So some of the most, uh, some of the older oldest black holes we've ever discovered are within these objects called quasars and they are pretty much as as far away as we can look um, pretty much as, as far away as we can look uh, kind of almost looking back in time to to the big bang so we're talking about 10 billion kind of years back back in time that's how far away these things are and what they've just discovered is a pair of black holes that are about 30% bigger than the biggest black hole that had ever been discovered before. So so the previous record holder was about 6 billion times the size of our sun, as opposed to the one in the centre of the Milky Way, which is about 3 million. Um, not only are they a lot further away, but these ones are 9 billion solar masses. They're so big that they are actually approaching a theoretical limit of how big black holes can actually be. Get before they become unstable or rip themselves apart. These things are Enormous. huge, Ab absolutely immense. I can't stress that enough. And the reason we haven't actually found these before is because unlike many of the other black holes, these ones are actually relatively dim. Mm. So let's take a step back for a moment. Black holes, the reasons we can see them is that we don't see them directly. We uh, infer their existence from a bunch of different measurements. So with typical quasars and typical galaxies that have black holes in the center of them, what researchers do is they, uh, they look at the stars rotating around the center of this black hole and they watch the speed. And from the speed that these stars orbit, the central black hole, you can figure out how big the black hole is um, because their orbit depends on the gravitational strength of the black hole. Mm. So what they did is they looked at these gravities, uh, they looked at these black holes and they watched how fast the stars were spinning around the centre and they inferred um, the existence of this black hole and its mass from that. Now these black holes are so big though that they've actually cleared up a lot of the dust and gas that's around them. Now this could be because they're really, really old, it could be a function of their size, they're not really, really sure. But it means that because the, the black hole has pretty much ingested all of this uh, dust and gas that could go on to form stars but hasn't, that the accretion disk, so this glowing mass of light that's around a black hole that actually allows us to see it, is actually really, really dispersed. So it's really, really hard to see which is why we've only just discovered them. And to put this finding in some kind of perspective, um, this totally changes our understanding of how black holes and galaxies and quasars form, what their, what their theoretical limitations are. And now we've discovered some of these, we can look for more like them and we can try and push this idea um, of an upper limit to the size of black holes. Yeah, because now we know what to look for. Absolutely, it's great, great stuff. Um, just to give people uh, uh, a couple of, of other fun facts, um, another thing that, that astronomers look for when they're looking at black holes is that gas that spins around black holes is spinning around at incredible speeds. And at that, uh, that speed, it actually gives off um, electromagnetic radiation, including light. That's why quasars are so bright. Um, so that's also something that they look for, obviously, that they weren't seeing here because the, the, the gas doesn't seem to be there anymore and the dust doesn't seem to be there anymore. Um, but just to give people an idea of the size of these things, the event horizon of this black hole and of another one very similar to it, they're about five times the distance from the Sun to Pluto. It's it's just, I mean, it's absolutely enormous. And, and the Milky Way galaxy's event horizon is one-fifth the orbit of Mercury. 
Uh, it just it just boggles the mind. If if you're having trouble with these numbers, you're an extremely good company. The okay. only way I can I can even imagine this is I'm looking right now at uh, at a Wikipedia image of the distance, the relative distance between uh, the planets in our solar system, and I'm trying to imagine superimpose the event horizons of these black holes onto that. And um, yeah, it's it's making my stomach go a little bit uh, turny. They're, they're extraordinary. I keep thinking I'd love to see something like that one day. <laughs> yeah, from from a safe from distance. a safe distance, absolutely. So yeah, I, I, I should say so. A common misconception is that black holes suck everything up like a vacuum cleaner. That's true inside the event horizon, but outside of the event horizon, they just act like a really, really, really massive object. Yeah. So you can still have a stable orbit um, uh, around the outside of a black hole, mm. uh, assuming it's not hugely packed with gas for a bunch of other reasons. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. And if you watch Star Trek, and particularly Star Trek Voyager, you may also have picked up that it's possible for the, Star Trek, uh, for the, um, for the Enterprise to, to be able to get stuck in the event horizon of a black hole and, and, and still be okay. Now, we're not sure about that so much. <laughs> FYI. This is a problem. Yeah, if, if you're interested in finding out more, I suggest Googling spaghettification. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Anyway, moving right along, Amy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is um, this is also just this is an amazing example of what our young people can do when they're okay, admittedly super smart, but also really well mentored and provided with all the right support and, and structures to do well. Now, uh, a young lady named Angela, uh, well, it's Z H A N G. I'm not sure how to pronounce that, so I'm going to go with Shang has just been awarded the $100,000 grand prize in the individual category of the Siemens Competition in Math, Science and Technology. Um, and I'm going to give you the name of her project and then explain what it actually means. So her project was entitled Design of Image Guided Photothermal Controlled Drug Release, uh, Controlled Drug Releasing Multifunctional Nanosystem for the Treatment of Cancer Stem Cells. I'd just like to point out that I still can't spell that title, um, <laughs> let alone do any research into it. But what what she's done is really interesting. She's she's been very interested in cancer for uh, some time now. It's it's affected her family, and she looked into the treatments um, that people are developing for cancer and thought, well, why aren't we doing more to target cancerous uh, or, or, or the stem cells for cancer rather than the the, the, um, the cancer cells themselves? And so what she's done is she's designed a a a nanoparticle. I mean, and this is still very early days, but a, nanop a nanoparticle which can be targeted to the site of these cancer stem cells and then activated with a laser to release a drug called salinomycin. Uh, salinomycin has been shown to be extremely effective in killing breast cancer cells, but it's also um, quite toxic, uh, for example. So, so what she's able to do here basically is to design a particle which can be targeted to a specific type of cancer. Once there, it can be activated with light um, and then can release the drug at that site and that site only as opposed to in the surrounding tissues. Um, it's being held apparently as the Swiss army knife of cancer treatment. Uh, uh, it's, it's just it's really, really clever. Um, and she also uh, included gold and iron oxide components which allow um, the tissue to be uh, uh, imaged is the word I'm looking for through MRI and photoacoustics so people can also see exactly what's going on. Um, she's a very clever young lady. <laughs> oh, absolutely amazing! So, so just to go over one more time, what these drugs, uh, what what these nanoparticles actually do. She, she, uh, the the drug in question, uh, selenomycin, was developed by by MIT. She not only took this and turned it into a uh, a multifunctional nanoparticle, which is is big enough in itself. That's huge. She then added about two or three different functionalities to it. So the reason she chose this drug is that this uh, particular drug specifically targets cancer stem cells mm -hmm. as opposed to general cancer cells. These are the cells that, um, that will actually help cancer migrate through the body and consistently produce new cancerous cells. Yeah. So once you've delivered this drug to a region, you use the laser to, to, to release this particular drug. That drug targets the cancerous cells, and then you can watch what's happening because of the, uh, the high toxicity of this drug. 